Good morning. I'm glad you're able to take a moment to devote to worship this weekend. And I do want to take a moment to uh, share and announce uh, where this church is standing, uh, the Shelbina and, and the Honeywell Methodist Church as well. Uh, we have installed UV lights in our HVAC systems. And so at this point, uh, Anything that's going through the air conditioner or the heater is going to be sterilized. Uh, that means that a combination of masks and these H, uh, UV lights that have been installed, I, we can say that being in worship is, is a as safe an activity as we can be uh, during this very odd time that we're living through. So. Uh, Masks, social distancing, uh, and, and these technological uh, installations, the UV lights, uh, I, I think w this is where we're going to be for the foreseeable future. The, the, the point at which I, I see us being able to uh, make a change in this, uh, I'm looking for a widespread vaccination. Um, and then uh, the health department be saying that we can uh, stop uh, being as concerned about masks. Uh, I do not expect that to happen this year, unfortunately. Uh, I would love to be wrong, but uh, that I think that's where, that's where we're headed for the next couple months. So uh, if you have any questions about that, uh, implications for, uh, I'm thinking about how we handle Thanksgiving and Easter, uh, j just let me know. And as we're going to roll with it as it happens. The reading this day comes from Colossians 3, 12 to 15. And so as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience, bearing with one another and forgiving each other. Whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you forgive. And beyond all these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you are called in one body, and be thankful. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Forgiveness and reconciliation transform tragedies into miracles. This is what Brian Zond, a pastor in Northwest Missouri in St. Joseph, wrote in his book, Radical Forgiveness. And ever since reading it, that has stuck with me, that forgiveness and reconciliation transform tragedies into miracles. It is at the heart of what Jesus does. Forgiving so that the tragedy of human separation, of human distance from each other and from God, can be transformed into the miracle that is known as following Jesus in this life and heading towards the kingdom that is to come after in the resurrection after death. Right? That, that, that's what happens. That's what we're holding on to. Our hope is rooted as Christians that forgiveness and reconciliation transform a tragedy into a miracle. Now, this all feels good in the abstracts, are talking about forgiveness and reconciliation. That all feels wonderful and warm and fuzzy. But to misapply a, a quote by Mike Tyson, everyone has a plan until they're punched in the mouth. And that seems to be to get at something profoundly true about forgiveness. It is easy to talk about it in the abstract, and then you get punched. And as you're standing there, bleeding, that's the moment when forgiveness becomes something to practice, and yet, it's not easy. It doesn't come naturally. It's something we have to think about ahead of time and practice and commit to and think through, because if we wait until the heat of the moment hits, it's not going to happen. Right? This is what Desmond Tutu realized as he was grappling with leading an entire nation through a practice of forgiveness. Desmond Tutu, you might know that name. Desmond Tutu was one of the leaders of the church in South Africa at the fall of apartheid. This is this, um, in his book, No Future Without Forgiveness, Archbishop Tutu lays out this situation that he faced. You see, apartheid was a 40-year regime from the 1950s until the late 1990s. At, during this time, a minority white government 
use the, the power of the government to remove native uh, tribes, native people of South Africa from their lands, from their suburbs, from their cities, so that they could cement their control uh, of the nation and, and gather their, its wealth unto themselves. And, and so it, it leads to this situation today where like, if you want to insult another nation, you can you either compare them to Nazi Germany as the most horrific uh, insult, and a close second to that would be South African apartheid. If you say someone is being a, acting like an apartheid state, like that is, those are fighting words, right? It's just a horrible situation. And, and so as uh, in the late 90s, 1997, 1998, uh, apartheid, the apartheid system is ending as N Nelson Mandela is freed after 27 years of imprisonment, uh, imprisonment because he resisted apartheid. And uh, an election occurs and Nelson Mandela is elected president. And the, here comes this moment where South Africa has to decide how to handle its past. A past that was truly ugly. A past that was ugly for those who had supported apartheid because they had blood on their hands. A past that was ugly for those who had resisted apartheid for there was blood on their hands too. And then there was, it was ugly for those who had pretended apartheid wasn't that bad and, and turned a blind eye because they had ignored much spilling of blood. To give you a sense of, of like the national tragedy, like the way that apartheid had hurt family after family after family, like if you go, start looking into what was happening, there is situation after situation where a mother would not know what had happened to her son. He would just have disappeared and, and be gone, and you would assume that he had died, but you, you just wouldn't know. Or there would be other situations where a family would know what had happened to a son because the son, it would, they would be, um, there was something called a, a necklace that would be used. Uh, it was a terror object, a way to terrorize villages into submission. They would fill up a, the, the soldiers of the apartheid state would fill up a, a a rubber tire with gasoline and put it, force it over someone's neck and light it on fire. And it was a way to terrorize populations, right? And so what do you do with a nation when so many of the people have been impacted by such wounds and trauma, right? When, what, and so well, the question becomes, and this is what Desmond Tutu and Nelson Mandela and the other leaders have to grapple with, what do we do? Where do we look for uh, inspiration? How else has national tragedy been handled in, in this way? <clears throat> there were two approaches that, that come to mind based upon what has happened in the last century. And, and both of them tried to sort of like make it simple, tried to make it easier, tried to kind of like get through it without really grappling with all the complexities of the situation. One example was to follow what had happened after World War II, the Nuremberg Trials. In the Nuremberg Trials, what happened was the victors put the losers on trial, and the victors decided the losers were guilty and punished. And um, the problem with this approach was first, it doesn't get the truth out. Because if you know that if you confess that you have done something, that you will go to jail for it, how many mothers would not know where their children were buried, would not know the truth of the situation because everyone would, everyone would clam up, right? Uh, court systems are not very good at extracting and getting the truth out of, of all the details. It, it, legal situations like that incentivize not talking, right? And, and so there's that problem. And then there's the very practical problem. So it's not going to do a good job of healing the wounds of the nation. And then there's a practical problem of World War II ended in a victor and a loser. Apartheid fell with a ceasefire. It fell because people agreed to stop shooting each other, stop fighting each other. And if courts were put together to try everyone who has committed a crime, if you're going to try to convict the entire police force in mass, the entire uh, 
army in mass like that it's just not going to work the ceasefire would not hold they would pick their guns back up and it would just blow apart at the seams again and so one approach of trying to figure out winners and losers the good guys and the bad guys or bad guys and punish them it, it wasn't going to work because it would not have addressed the pain of the nation and it would have blown apart the ceasefire so that that wasn't going to work the other option was to be inspired by what the British and Irish, uh, the Irish did. Now, Britain and Ireland, as you may remember, had uh, decades of violence. They, would, they had this sort of like low uh, simmering guerrilla warfare happening between Britain and Ireland. It killed at least three and a half thousand people over multiple decades from the 1960s until 1998 with the signing of the Good Friday Agreement. And, and I, I love the naming of this. It's so British understated. They call this time the Troubles. Like, it's, <laughs> it just seems like such an understatement for having a low-grade guerrilla warfare situation on your border for just decade after decade. Oh, what's going on? Oh, it's just the Troubles. <laughs> um, so what happened was, the Troubles ended with the signing of the Good Friday Agreement, and they then pretended that nothing had ever happened. Like, that, is, that, that was the response. Like, we're just not going to talk about it. We're not going to deal with it. There won't be any process to handle. All the, all the families, all the grief, all the pain from all the people who had lost loved ones, it's not, we're just moving on. We're going to pretend it didn't happen, right? Pretend it didn't happen. Didn't work. It's still, Ireland and Britain still don't really get along, right? It, uh, they ignored their collective past. And what, what has happened is every once in a while, like, it just boils up again. It just festers up. And, and, and like, uh, there's this guy named Jerry Adams, who's the leader of Sinn Féin, uh, a political leader during the, tr the Troubles, and then a political leading the resistance to the British, and then a political leader uh, after the Good Friday Agreement. And back in 2014, he was arrested based upon uh, the accusations around murders that happened 42 years previously and like how what would it be like to ha have a political system in which you know that some of the political leaders were actively involved in terrorism and had never been dealt with and then every once in a while they might be accused and then nothing happens based upon this accusation because there wasn't any uh, there wasn't enough evidence and um, at the same time a few years ago there was a big to do around uh, the British government giving secret pardons to its own forces, to its own military uh, forces, police forces, just saying, anything you did during that time, we're just, we're just going to pardon all of it. We're just not going to grapple with it. We're not going to touch it. We're not going to deal with it. It's all fine. It's all fine. It's all fine. Don't, don't look at it. It's all fine, right? To this day, Britain and Ireland really don't get along. If you have followed the Brexit vote, the effort by Britain to leave the European Union, you'll know that... Um, the, the Irish border is still the sticking point, right? It is still the problem. And what has happened is like Britain and Ireland and trying to ignore everything that happened and pretend it was, it's all good. And what they have done is left landmines for themselves. And they just trip over them every once in a while and it doesn't get better. And so those are the two examples that South Africa could, could follow from the last century of examples of how nations and how uh, vast communities can have dealt with, with grief on, on a national level. They could either try to establish winners and losers, put everyone in front, through a, a, a trial, and then have their nation blow up as the ceasefire ended, right? Or they could pretend that nothing happened and then just keep on pretending that nothing happened and, and let's just move on, and let's just move on. And um, those two sound familiar, right? Those are the temptations when we, when, when something goes wrong, those are the two temptations. Those are the two ways that feel, uh, come easiest, come, uh, na feel most natural, right? right? Fill out, figure out who's right and who's wrong, punish the person who's wrong, and, and that's it, right? Or uh, just pretend nothing happened and move along. Desmond Tutu and the leaders in South Africa looked at those two options and, and they chose a third way. They chose a third way. They formed the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. This commi this, uh, commi the Truth and Reconciliation Commission uh, traveled the length and breadth of the nation and they listened. 
it was a group of, of them, a representative of all the various parts of, of the nation, and they gave a venue for people to tell their story. Victims of violence were heard, and reparations were made. When a mother uh, told of a son who, who had been murdered, you can't bring that son back, but you can make sure that son's, where that son was buried is known, and you can put a tombstone there. And, and when a, a parent, a, when a, a father dies, you can't bring the father back, but you can make sure the children are, are going to be funded for an education. Right? You could do something. Right? And so they listened to the victims of all sides. There were victims from all parties involved. Right? It, it, it gets messy. Right? So they listened to the victims of, of violence and reparations were made. And then they listened to those who had committed the crimes themselves. And, and this is what the offer was. If you come and you tell the truth during this time, this year and some of how long the commission is running, if you come and tell the truth, you will receive amnesty. All right, if you are part of the healing of the nation. If you do not, when the Truth and Reconciliation Commission is done, you can be charged. So you really need to come and, and fess up now so that we can all hear the situation, hear the stories. And that what they grappled with are the same things that we grapple with ourselves when it comes to forgiveness. Right? Can, can someone's apology ever feel sincere enough to the person who's been hurt? Right? There's no apology that can stop someone's bleeding or bring someone back once they are dead. But knowing the truth and having the person who caused the harm acknowledge it, is that enough? Is that enough to move forward? Is forgiveness condoning what someone has done? No, it's not. Right? To be able to learn that to forgive a person, right, to, to forgive a person, it, it, they can do that without saying what they did was okay or somehow less painful. All right? they, didn't have to, they didn't have to ask people to say, oh, it wasn't a big deal. What they could say is, I forgive you, and yes, you did hurt me. They had to grapple with the question, can people change? All right. The church was highly involved in this process of truth-telling. And, and the, as members of the church, we believe that people are made in the image of God, called to be in community with one another. And so we believe that no matter how far a person has fallen, that the image of God cannot be erased. And to say that a person cannot change is to give up on what God can do. And so, yes, people can change. Through this process, which took years, the nation of South Africa heard the truth about its past. Victims could tell their story. The people who had caused much pain could, could find amnesty. And the people who had sat on the sidelines and said, it's not that bad, listening to hour after hour after hour of this on the radio, they, they had to come open their eyes and see that, no, it, it really had been. Right? And, and so they heard the truth without blowing up into factions that took up arms against each other. And in doing so, a nation was able to tell the truth very, about its past, something that is very hard to do. And the nation held together one person at a time, confessing, listening, and forgiving. My friends, it is this third way that we are called to follow as the church. Not to try to figure out good guys and bad guys. Not to pretend that... Uh, hurt and pain has never happened. It is this third way of telling the truth, forgiving, offering forgiveness and amnesty. It's this way that, that we are called to as the church. This is what Paul is talking about as he writes to the church at Colossae. In Colossians 3.12, he writes, Those who have been chosen of God put on a heart of compassion, of kindness, Humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with one another and forgive each other. Whoever has a complaint, just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you forgive. Bearing with one another, forgiving one another, practicing humility and patience, putting this on day after day as sort of the clothing of a Christian. Right? Jesus tells his disciples that doing so has real power. He tells his disciples, if you forgive the sins of any, their sins have been forgiven. If you retain their sins, their sins have been retained. Between these passages and many more, which we'll look at in detail over the coming weeks, 
I can tell you that I am convinced that this is exactly what we are called to be as a church. Every church is called to be this. A place where we learn the practicalities and challenges of forgiveness. Now, if we want to get into the, the nuts and bolts of how does forgiveness, how do we practice that today? Like, we don't start by forgiving uh, a situation like in South Africa. Right? We don't jump right into that. It's a great way to get into the, what the, our focus is as Christians, right? but we don't jump straight into forgiving the worst things that can happen to us. We, we start smaller. Right, we start smaller. And it's Adam Hamilton, pastor of the Church of the Resurrection in Kansas City, who has helped me understand how this works. He, he helps me underst has helped me understand that um, when we sin against someone, what we're doing is we're, we're putting a burden on their lives. Right? We're putting a burden on their lives. If you want to conceptualize that burden as a stone, right? the worse that we, we sin against the person, the bigger the burden, the bigger the stone, whether it be a small, a large, or like a boulder that we put upon their lives. And if you want an example of what I'm talking about, right? if let's say someone moves a woman's purse without telling them, like, the burden that has been placed upon them is now they have to take the time to find their purse. That's a very small burden, but it's still a burden, right? Let's say that that purse is moved and the person uh, sees the keys and takes them out, takes the car keys out and takes them, steals the car keys, doesn't do anything else, just steals the car keys. That, that's a bigger burden, right? Because now... It's a real pain to replace a car key anymore. It's not like just going up and getting it cut at the uh, hardware shop. Now it's quite, quite the deal. That, that's a greater rock. Let's say the same situation, but this time someone moves a woman's purse, sees the car keys, takes the keys, and go takes the car and steals the car. Now that, that's a huge burden. Like that, that's a massive burden on that person's life that's been placed on the boulder of a burden on that person's life. Right? And, and so forgiveness can be thought of, of le as of putting the burden down. Putting the burden down, refusing to carry them with us. Right? And so today, well, we don't start by forgiving the greatest sins. We, well, we're going to start today at, at the small end of, of the scale. We're, we're going to start with, with the, the, the small burdens, the small rocks, so to speak. Right? Knowing that as we practice forgiving the small things, that prepares us to live a life such that we can handle forgiving the larger, greater challenges. So let's imagine throughout the course of the day that you are driving to work and someone cuts you off on the highway. And so that, that's, you're annoyed. Someone's placed a burden on you. You've got to slow down. And, and, and then you go by Casey's and someone cuts in front of you in line. And, and now you're, slow, you're slowed down. You're trying to get out of there. You're already running late. And that's another, another rock. And then you get to work and someone's called in sick. And you're not really sure if they really were sick. You got a bad history of calling in when they're really not sick, and now you've got to do their work as well, right? And then you run home for lunch, and your spouse has eaten the leftovers you were going to have for lunch, and now that's a grumble, grumble. Now I got to make something, and I didn't plan on taking the time to make something because I got to call the insurance company, and and I'm on hold forever. And then the, I talk to the person who's supposed to be able to help me, and and they can't. And even though it's their job, they're not very good at their job, and and I can't get my insurance problem figured out. And and then you get back to work, and someone's late to an appointment, and and that messes up your afternoon because you can't get any, what you need to done. And then someone's supposed to call you back, and so you can get another task finished, and and, and they don't. And and you see how this adds up, right? By the end of the day, if if every time someone uh, annoys or offends us, someone places even small burdens on our lives, by the end of the day, it starts to get to add up so that by the end of the day, when you sit down to watch a TV show and the satellite's out or the internet's out, like you're, you're just ready to be offended immediately. You're ready to be annoyed. And, and yeah. And so what do we do about this? Right, what do we do with all of these small offenses if we're people that put on compassion and kindness, humility, bearing with one another and forgiving, as Paul describes? 
The best advice I have found, again, comes from Adam Hamilton talking about these, these burdens that stack up. And his, his advice when it comes to the small burdens that are placed on us when others sin against us and the, all these small things that can stack up is first to remember. Remember that, you know what, I, I've cut people off in traffic too. And there are things I've done to offend people even without realizing it. I, I, I didn't fold the laundry right. I didn't know I didn't fold the laundry right, but you know what, I'm not perfect, so I'm, I'm just, I'm gonna let go of that. I'm not gonna let it get to me, I'm just gonna let go of it, and, and, and it'll be oh, okay, right? Remembering that we are not perfect makes it far easier to be graceful with other people's mistakes. So first, remember, we're not perfect ourselves. Second, to assume the best about the person. The person who cuts me off is, is needs to get ahead of me. Um, you know what, they, they might be running late and they have something really important to do, like just assume the best about people's intentions. And, and, the, and the person who didn't call me back, you know, maybe they had an emergency show up, maybe something happened, you know what, just I trust that they're competent, it'll be fine. Just assume the best about people's intentions. Like they, they mean well and, and, and just trust them, right? So remember that I'm not perfect. Assume that the other person means well and is not trying to assume the best about the other people. And then stop and choose to pray. That person who couldn't do their job well, I, I pray for them. I pray, pray for God to bless them and to work through them and, and be good in their lives. Right? Sometimes the words are hard to find, I admit. When I'm in the middle of trying to pray for someone who's offended me, sometimes the best I can do is, God bless them, because I'm struggling right now, right? So remember that we're not perfect. Assume that the person means well, and there's a reason something is happening, and then pray for the person. Remember, assume, and pray. And if you want to make an acronym out of that, RAP, remember, assume, and pray. Go ahead. All right. This is how we let go of the small rocks, the small burdens. It's how we practice what Jesus talks about. Jesus talks about forgiving 70 times 7 times, which does not mean that we forgive 490 times, but then on the 491st time I, I'm offended that we just kill somebody, right? That's not what Jesus is talking about. Seventy times seven times is describing a, a way of life to completely forgive as a day in and day out. In practicing forgiving the small things day in and day out, what we are doing is preparing to be able to forgive in the greater challenges. If when I learn to put down the small rocks, to, to not be, to let go of that burden, then I'm, prepare, I'm preparing myself to be able to handle when forgiving when someone does intentional harm, the, the acts that break relationships, and, and that's what we'll turn to next week. And so please this week, remember, we're not perfect. Assume the best about others and pray. And in doing so, let go of those burdens so that we might be able to follow Jesus more freely. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, while we are tempted to pray that we would never be hurt, we would never need to forgive others, we read your story and we read how often you forgive Israel, how often your son forgives others, and we hear Paul's call to the churches to forgive as we have been forgiven, and we know that there will be moments when we have to forgive. And so we pray for your help and guidance that when the moment comes and we are hurt, that we might pause and look to you and be able to remember our own faults, assume the best of others, and pray for them, knowing that they are beloved by you. Amen. And now may the peace of Christ be with you. Go forth this day in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.